Good morning. Um, well, welcome to our program. Um, I would like to uh, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is an important topic that we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk about um, how to make compost. I'm going to give you some uh, suggestions on um, techniques that will uh, ensure success. Um, we're going to discuss a little bit of uh, why we need to compost and then what you can do with it once you've made it. Um, before we get started, I'd like to uh, uh, give you a couple of other uh, uh, bits of information. Uh, I always like to tell my classes um, the, the uh, core mission of a master gardener uh, is uh, to be a community educator. And um, we are ethically bound to uh, consider uh, scientific uh, information when we uh, present uh, the materials that we do. Um, I know out there in the uh, internet, uh, you can find all kinds of information, uh, some good, some bad. Um, personally, I like to stick to the .edu's and the .org's. Um, those are uh, sources of information that typically are uh, a little bit better than uh, dot coms. So uh, when you go out and do your research, uh, take a look first for any of the universities with the dot edu's and, and uh, um, governmental organizations or state organizations that have dot orgs. Um, okay. Well, I guess, uh, I guess it's time to get started. So composting, uh, we call it nature's way to healthy soil. Um, let me see if I can, we're not advancing. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so what is composting? Well, it's nothing but a, a natural biological process. Uh, microorganisms that exist in the environment um, break down organic materials. Uh, actually, they eat them. Uh, they use them as their food and uh, leave a residue that uh, is highly uh, digested and decomposed. Uh, we use this decayed organic matter uh, as a soil amendment. Uh, so we can add it to our soil uh, to improve uh, both the structure and, and fertility uh, of our garden soil. Nature provides us compost wherever there's plant debris. Uh, depending upon the soil and uh, climate conditions, um, nature's process can take quite a while, up to a, a year or more uh, to uh, break down organic matter and make compost. Now we can improve on that because if we manage the factors needed to break down organic matter, um, we can uh, certainly produce quality compost in a much shorter time. So why compost? Well, <clears throat> Americans recycle oh, up to maybe a third of their daily trash. The rest goes into uh, landfills. A lot of municipalities are struggling to find landfill space. Um, and it's always a hassle for um, uh, communities to uh, uh, be able to keep up with just the, the trash that's uh, its, its members um, uh, submit. Now, 75% uh, of that material that's destined for landfills can be recycled. Uh, much of that is yard and, and kitchen waste. Um, we can take the yard and kitchen waste and uh, recycle it, making compost, and take some of the pressure off uh, municipal landfills. Um, while I'm happy to help my community, um, I have a much more personal reason for wanting to compost. Um, 
The one thing I've learned uh, over 35 years of gardening, uh, the single most important thing I can do to improve my garden soil is to return organic matter to the soil on a consistent basis. If you feed the soil, it will feed your plants. So the benefits of composting are, are many. Um, by composting and returning that decomposed organic matter, uh, we change that soil. We change it physically, chemically, and biologically. Those changes benefit the soil, making it a better environment, which plants can grow uh, with less stress from nutrient and water deficiency uh, or insect and, and disease pressures. Your plants will let you know what kind of physical changes uh, occur in the soil. Well, adding compost decompacts uh, compacted soil. So uh, you decrease the soil density to provide a better tilth, which is just a fancy word for the physical condition of your soil. And that facilitates root growth and penetration for one. If uh, you think like a root, you're gonna take the easy path every time. Soil structure is improved by adding pore space, which allows increased infiltration of air and water. Um, again, you will see the difference in your plants. Biological changes. Uh, compost is food for the microorganisms that live in our soil. By adding compost, uh, we can stimulate that growth and variety of microbes. And uh, the greater variety of microbes, the, the more benefits occur to the uh, soil system. So um, compost provides them both a habitat and a shelter from predation. Anything we can do to promote the growth and diversity of those populations benefits our soil, which in turn, of course, benefits our plants. Again, your plants will let you know. You will see the difference. Chemical changes, well, uh, as microorganisms decompose organic matter, they release plant nutrients, macronutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, uh, calcium, uh, magnesium, and, and sulfur. Uh, and then uh, there's a number of micro elements that are also uh, released. And they, uh, they produce those elements in a chemical form that plants can immediately use. They also secrete um, biological substance, which help form soil aggregates. And uh, soil aggregates are the foundation of, uh, of good soil structure. They also secrete natural pesticides, which discourage soil pathogens and disease occurrence. Okay, let me introduce you to, uh, to a, a topic here that you may not be familiar with. And that's cation exchange capacity. If we look at uh, soil as the bank for uh, water and nutrients, uh, the ability to hold water and nutrients is called cation exchange capacity. So if we add compost, this increases the capacity, allowing your soil to store more water and more nutrients. Increasing the content of organic matter in our soil is about the only practical way to raise cation exchange capacity. And here's, here's how it works. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see um, a, a, a micro uh, organic particle called humus. And that humus is so small, it actually has uh, an electrical charge, and that electrical charge is negative. So because it has an electric or, or negative electrical charge, uh, it will attract cations, the positive ions you see of calcium, magnesium, and potassium. Uh, so it actually stores those cations on the humus. The middle uh, diagram shows um, 
a clay particle. Uh, clay particles are interesting. They're very, very small. It takes uh, quite a powerful microscope to be able to see them. They look like broken shingles, broken wood shingles, uh, when, you, when you see them under the microscope. And because they're small, they also hold a negative charge and they attract the cations, uh, uh, just like humus particles do. And then finally, in, on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see an organic chelate. And that chelate um, has a negative charge as well, not as, as strong a negative charge as, as uh, the humus or the clay particles, but uh, enough to, in fact, hold uh, some cations. So what do we need to compost? Well, uh, not, not too much. Uh, obviously, we need some organic matter to start with. Um, we need microorganisms to, uh, to do the work, so we got to have a crew. Um, a little air, a little water, and uh, a location. Organic matter. Well, what is it? comes in many forms, um, fallen leaves, grass clippings, plant residue, kitchen scraps, anything that was once living is uh, organic matter. We can divide our compostables uh, into two general categories, material that has a high carbon content, we call those the browns, and material that has a high nitrogen content, we call those the greens. Here's a good example of what the greens might look like. This is all kitchen scraps. Um, not everything is green, but uh, it has uh, a high uh, nitrogen content and uh, usually they're, they're green and, and moist. So carbon materials, carbon's a necessary ingredient in composting. It comes from uh, carbohydrates in the organic matter. Uh, microbes uh, breaking down that organic matter use it as food to fuel their decomposition activities. And materials with carbon content are mostly brown in color and dry. That's a perfect example of uh, brown and dry. Um, fallen leaves, and uh, it's a perfect thing to uh, add to your compost pile for uh, carbon uh, organic matter. How about the nitrogen materials? Well, nitrogen is another essential ingredient. Uh, microbes use the nitrogen to uh, build protein, and uh, that helps them build their own bodies and reproduce more microbes. Nitrogen materials are mostly green in color and moist. That's a good example also. Uh, fresh grass clippings uh, are, are uh, a perfect addition to your compost pile. Microorganisms, so they do the work. Uh, they decompose and digest our organic matter. Uh, first, it's bacteria and fungi. Uh, they uh, are the predominant organisms that appear first. And in fact, they're pretty much there all the way through. Um, they do most of the work. A little bit later, more organisms come to help finish the job. Bacteria uh, of a different nature and, and uh, different kinds of uh, fungi, protozoa, rotifers, earthworms, beetles, roaches, and, and, and other things. So uh, the following is a, a short list of the microbes that are involved in composting. And this is for your reference. Um, the bacteria are primarily mesophilic, which means that they like temperatures that we like. Uh, middle temperatures, and then thermophilic bacteria, which are high temperature bacteria. Uh, they decompose the complex organic uh, compounds and uh, utilize their carbon and nitrogen. Moles and yeasts are types of fungi that break down lignin 
and woody materials, which bacteria usually cannot process. Um, there's another type of bacteria called actinomycetes, and it's necessary for composting uh, paper and bark. Protozoans consume some bacteria and fungi and uh, some microorganic particulates. So they actually do a little bit of processing of the organic matter as well. And rotifers help control populations of bacteria and protozoans. Here's a, here's a picture of um, the different types of organisms you might see. In the lower left-hand corner, we have organic residues. And then from there, uh, you can see we have the actinomycetes, fungi, bacteria, rotifers, and, and on and on. So uh, I, I included this just so if you have a compost pile, you might in fact um, uh, see some bugs and insects running around. So this may help you identify uh, what's there. Um, in the lower right-hand corner, we have uh, a group that includes beetles, uh, sow bugs, flies, nematodes, millipedes, and earthworms. Now the earthworms are interesting. Um, it shows their size between 50 and 150 millimeters. 150 millimeters is about six inches. Um, but be uh, aware that uh, if you have a compost pile, um, you may have some special uh, earthworms. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, my better half and I were unloading our compost pile, spreading it out on our garden beds uh, as mulch. And I was loading up the wheelbarrow and running it over to the garden beds and dumping it. And she was spreading the, the mulch uh, uh, across the bed. So I went back to the uh, compost pile and all of a sudden I heard a shriek. I said, uh oh, I know that shriek. That's a snake screech. And went back to see what she had found. And in fact, it was an earthworm, but it was an earthworm that was at least a foot long. It was as thick as my uh, little finger. I've never seen an earthworm that big, um, but uh, just be aware that you might have some uh, uh, rather strange looking earthworms uh, if, you, if you do your compost. Air and water, okay. Um, just like people and plants, uh, all the microorganisms that do the work of composting uh, need an air and water to survive. Uh, we introduce air as we build our pile by stacking layer and layer. Uh, uh, together. And we also add a little water to each layer. We want a moist pile, but not a dripping wet pile. Um, I'll show you some tricks here to figure out just how much water you need to put in. Um, in fact, moisture is probably the, the number one reason compost efforts fail. Um, the ideal moisture level is about 55%. If we take uh, a handful of material and we squeeze it, does it feel dry or just damp? If it does, that's 45% or less, and that's too dry. If we squeeze it and some drops of water drip out, that's about 55%, and that's just right. But if we squeeze it and water runs out, uh, like your kitchen sponge when you're squeezing it over the sink, uh, that's 65% or more, and that's too wet. So we want that, that middle ground where you squeeze it and you can get a few drips of water out of it, uh, but water doesn't run out of it when, uh, when it's squeezed. Location. This isn't absolutely necessary, but it does help to have a convenient location to uh, locate your compost pile. Uh, most people provide some kind of bin to confine the pile while, while it decomposes. And bins can be made of wood, wire mesh, cylinder, uh, cinder blocks, or any material that uh, will help uh, confine the pile. You can also buy ready-made bins or drums or make your own. 
Here's an example of uh, a homemade compost bin uh, uh, that um, a couple of master gardeners have at their home. Uh, this is what we call a continuous pile. Uh, material goes in at the top, uh, it's processed, uh, and these slats are removable, so you can pull the slats out at the bottom and take out the finished compost. This takes a while, uh, but hopefully you've always got some amount of compost uh, necessary. And you can see uh, the bags on the uh, lower left-hand side of uh, more materials that are waiting to uh, go in on the top. Uh, now this is this is a good example of of how to do a continuous uh, compost pile, um, as opposed to what we would call a batch uh, compost pile. Now here are some bins. Uh, the one you'll see at the uh, lower left hand corner is is a version of what we just looked at at, at the home of the master gardeners. The other three are are rotating bins that you uh, can put materials in and actually uh, uh, turn them. Uh, the one at the top left has two doors, I guess one for greens and one for browns. And then you can uh, shut those doors and uh, 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 rotate the, uh, the bin. And uh, uh, basically you're, you're turning the pile when you do that. Same thing with the other other two uh, bins. Now the one at the bottom right, if I own that, I, the first thing I would do is get out my drill and, and drill bigger holes in, in the end so I had plenty of water. Problem with, with bins is uh, you're, you're limited to a certain amount. Uh, so this is what we would call a batch pile. And um, they tend to get waterlogged if uh, uh, you're not careful with how much water you put in. Um, and for the smaller bins, like the one on the top left, I would actually put a stick diagonally inside. So as I rotated that bin, it would break up any organic mass that is in that bin. But these are some good examples of uh, commercially what's available. <clears throat> now here's another uh, method. Um, this is what we use at the uh, uh, demonstration gardens at, at uh, Carbide Park. Uh, we have a four bin system set up there, but uh, we start out with uh, the raw materials uh, in the first bin. Uh, we let those compost for a while, flip them to the second bin, let those compost some more, and then flip them to the third bin. Um, this, this was uh, my personal compost uh, bin when I uh, moved to my house in Texas City uh, and decided I was going to put in a garden. Uh, I wanted a compost pile, so uh, I picked the corner of uh, uh, my fence row here uh, for a two-bin uh, compost pile. And this is what it looked like after I finished. Uh, you'll see that I put uh, wood slats up um, on the inside of the fence so I didn't compost my fence. Uh, I have slats that uh, in the front of each bin that, that uh, I can remove and slats um, down the middle so I can open that up and, and flip the uh, uh, pile from one side to the other. And you can see I, I keep uh, my uh, materials uh, ready to go in that empty uh, second bin. Um, I also have a temperature gauge and a range gauge, a rain gauge, um, among, among a few other things. Um, we'll come back to this uh, a little bit later because I want to show you some of the uh, uh, consequences of where you uh, locate your compost pile. So managing the process. All right. Now, depending on size and weather factors, 
properly constructed compost pile um, will we'll produce usable compost just within a number of weeks to several months. Uh, if you don't give it uh, that much attention, uh, it may take as long as a year. The following guidelines uh, allow us to manage the various factors involved in, in uh, composting. Uh, so uh, the first thing we need to learn about is a carbon nitrogen ratio. All organic matter contains carbon and nitrogen. So each has a carbon nitrogen ratio. Uh, the browns are high in carbon and low in nitrogen. Dried leaves, for example, have a ratio of about 50 to one. Okay. Now the greens are lower in carbon and higher in nitrogen. Fresh grass clippings, for instance, have a ratio of about 15 to one. That's 15 carbon to one uh, nitrogen. So they're still carbon dominant, but uh, uh, the ratio is just smaller uh, when it comes to the greens. So research and experience have shown uh, uh, composting is most efficient when we have a specific ratio of materials and that ratio is about 30 to one. Actually, uh, it's most efficient with a little bit lower ratio of about 20 to one. It is quickest when we have a ratio of about 30 to one. So that's what we're gonna uh, work with that 30 to one ratio just uh, to expedite our composting process. So if you get above a ratio of 40 to one, the pile will begin to be nitrogen starved. It may not heat up to a sufficient temperature to rapidly complete the composting process. All right, below 20 to one, uh, too much nitrogen is present and it's gonna be lost to the atmosphere as ammonia and you will definitely smell the ammonia. Okay, so here is a a graph of uh, the carbon nitrogen ratio effects on, on composting. Uh, we have temperature on the left hand side and uh, days of decomposition uh, on the bottom. So if we have a 60 to one ratio, you can see we get a little bit of a bump in temperature, but it falls off pretty quick and, and doesn't do too much. With a 40 to one ratio, we get a much higher temperature and it lasts a little bit longer, but again, uh, uh, cools off. And if we use a 30 to one ratio, you can see that we get a much higher temperature and there's, uh, it lasts much longer. So uh, uh, that's why that 30 to one ratio is what uh, will be our target. So here are some ratios of common materials, uh, poultry, dairy manure, table scraps, grass clippings, coffee grounds. Coffee grounds are, are uh, an excellent addition to your compost pile. Uh, horse manure, especially if it has bedding. Uh, you can see that paper and sawdust are pretty high in carbon. So uh, it doesn't, uh, I mean, uh, uh, adding uh, a, a lot of sawdust or paper to your uh, compost pile, you really have to balance that off with a, uh, a great degree of nitrogen. What we're going to do is we're going to find a balanced ratio of about 30 to 1. And, um, you know, you often hear uh, conflicting information about, uh, well, uh, it's, it's, uh, two times the, the browns to greens. Now it's three times the browns to greens. Well, we're, we're gonna figure it out. And uh, this will give you the way to do it so uh, you could be successful composting. We're gonna use an example of nothing but leaves and uh, grass clippings. So if you remember uh, our dried leaves were about 50 to one and uh, our grass clippings were about 15 to one. Um, 
and we're going to build a pile of just leaves and grass clippings, uh, but the parts are going to be of equal weight. Okay, we have one part leaves, that's 50 to one, one part fresh grass clippings, that's 15 to one. If we add the 50 and the 15, we get 65 divided by two, and we get a 32.5. Well, that's pretty close. So the final CN ratio of that um, combination of materials would be 32.5 to one. So um, let's go back and remember that um, picture of the wheelbarrow with grass clippings. So if you picked up that wheelbarrow and uh, kind of lifted it uh, by the handles, uh, how heavy would it be? Well, it's it's got some weight to it, but it's not as heavy as bricks would be, but um, it, it still has a little bit of weight. How about, um, how about a wheelbarrow full of uh, dried leaves? How heavy is that? Well, what is, what is a pile of dried leaves. That's mostly air. <laughs> uh, it doesn't weigh much at all. So it may take three, it may take four wheelbarrows of leaves by weight to equal one wheelbarrow of fresh grass clippings. So that's all you have to do is estimate it. You don't have to weigh anything, but just try and, and uh, balance it out as best you can uh, by weight. And uh, that's going to be uh, how you build your pile. So the shape and volume of your pile can be important, <clears throat> uh, re regardless of whether it's square, round, rectangular, whatever. Uh, usually a, a cubic yard of material, and that's three feet by three feet by three feet, is a good size to start with. <clears throat> Deeper piles cause higher temperatures. Uh, that continuous pile we saw at the Master Gardener home probably reached a pretty, pretty high temperature uh, because it was uh, quite, a, quite a tall pile. Remember though, uh, somebody's probably going to be turning that pile. So if it uh, is too big, it, it becomes unmanageable and you need to pick a size you can handle. Um, once you start turning compost piles, you'll, you'll appreciate the fact that uh, um, you could have a, a, a small pile. <laughs> Shredding the materials. So composting uh, is more efficient and goes more quickly if the organic materials are shredded before uh, putting them into the pile. Shredding increases the surface area that the microbes have to work on. It also increases pore space for air and water. A mulching lawnmower can roughly shred your ingredients, um, leaves, um, kitchen scraps, um, garden waste. Now a chipper shredder will uh, more finely shred all of the materials, uh, including loose clothing and body parts. It's the most dangerous thing I do in my garden. So please, if you have a chipper shredder, be careful. Okay. Here's another graph on particle size and its effects on composting. You can see down at the bottom uh, a six inch diameter uh, particle uh, doesn't get as much as far as uh, temperature and, and uh, decomposition. Uh, with a two inch diameter, we get a little bit higher temperature and uh, it lasts longer. But with a one inch diameter, we get even more and uh, days of decomposition are longer. Okay, providing the microorganisms. Some microbes will automatically exist on the organic matter you start with. Given good conditions, they'll rapidly reproduce. 
Uh, you can buy commercial inoculation kits if you want. Here's some examples. Uh, upper left-hand corner, compost starter. Uh, next to that is compost treat. Yes, my, my pets get treats. Why not my compost pile? And uh, mycoblast down at the lower left-hand corner. Uh, that's actually for... Uh, inoculating with uh, fungi, uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, and over in the right-hand lower corner, we have a box of all-purpose compost plus. All it needs is a picture of Betty Crocker. You can buy it or you can just add some garden soil, which has all the microbes you need. Uh, finished compost works equally as well. So providing sufficient nitrogen. If your CNN ratio is low on nitrogen, if it's above 30 to one, you can add uh, inorganic nitrogen fertilizer uh, to help those microbes uh, get the nitrogen they need. Uh, urea 4600 is an excellent nitrogen source that dissolves in water. It's immediately available to your, to your uh, uh, microbes. You just sprinkle a handful or two over the pile, water it in. Uh, some people uh, feel like organic sources of nitrogen are better since they contain proteins that the microorganisms can use. And good sources of organic nitrogen are blood meal, cottonseed meal, manure, and alfalfa. Uh, cost may be a factor for organics. But let's stop for a minute and, and, and think about this. Um, if I was going to add uh, blood meal, cottonseed meal, uh, manure, or alfalfa to my compost pile, I mean, all those are great sources of nitrogen. But all they are is more organic matter. Uh, when I add organic fertilizer to my garden soil, uh, that fertilizer is not available to my plants until the microbes in the soil break it down. So just like um, adding it to your compost pile, the microbes in the compost pile would have to break down the organic matter just like they're doing on all the other organic matter before that nitrogen is available. That's why I recommend using something like urea because you dissolve it, you just sprinkle a few handfuls uh, and uh, water it in. Yeah. Okay. So if we do everything right, uh, when we build that pile, it won't be long before it begins to heat up. Uh, and that means that the microbes are at work. Um, you know what uh, uh, that increase in temperature is when you uh, build a compost pile. Uh, that means that um, many, many additional microbes have been uh, created and uh, each one is like a little micro heater. So as your temperature goes up, uh, that means that more and more microbes are on the job to uh, break down that uh, organic matter. So temperature is a very important thing to monitor. Uh, let's just know what stage the composting process is in. Um, within a few days to a week, the center of your pile should be hot to the touch. Uh, and it could get quite hot. Uh, temperatures can reach 160 degrees. Actually, it can go uh, higher than that. Um, I've had a compost pile that uh, probably was 170 to 80 degrees, and I had ash in the center when I broke that compost pile down. Uh, we don't want it to, uh, to get that high, uh, and that's why we use some kind of a th a compost thermometer, because it's a very helpful tool to help us monitor that. You can see uh, on this particular picture, the uh, uh, temperature's right about 150. 
and that's an ideal temperature for your uh, compost pile. So as the pile heats up, uh, water is going to be lost as steam and oxygen is going to be depleted by the exploding populations uh, of your thermophilic bacteria Without sufficient water and oxygen, um, your, your uh, bacteria and uh, fungi begins to die off. Uh, when they die off, the pile cools. And uh, you may actually have uh, exhausted their food source uh, as well, uh, which is the carbon. In order to bring more air and water and fresh organic material uh, becomes necessary to turn that pile. And when we turn a pile, basically what we're doing is we're putting the outside on the inside and the inside from the old pile goes on the outside. So uh, what, what are important temperatures? Well, uh, from 131 degrees on up, uh, we start killing weed seeds and disease organisms. Um, it, might, it might take uh, up to 160 degrees. Uh, if you remember your, your uh, kitchen rules, uh, when they uh, ask you to use a thermometer to uh, test your food to see if it's reached an internal temperature, what do they usually look for? About 165 degrees. So temperatures between 140 and 55 degrees, um, that's, that's the optimum uh, temperature. Uh, and you let that, you let that go uh, for as long as it can go uh, before you turn your pile. Uh, if it gets to about 160 degrees, uh, you're gonna start killing off uh, your thermophilic bacteria. Purpose of turning the pile is to remix ingredients, uh, redistribute microorganisms, and introduce more air and water. It's also a good time to add nit nitrogen if, if uh, you, in fact, need that. Uh, and a remix pile will start off cool, but it will reheat quickly, uh, and the entire process will be repeated. So after several turnings, uh, the pile is going to continue to reheat, but it's going to peak at a lower and lower temperature, and it's going to take longer and longer to reach that peak. At some point, <clears throat> uh, we're going to decide to stop turning the pile and to let it cure. Uh, we're going to get tired of turning that pile to begin with because that is work, but uh, uh, the curing process that comes after we've uh, decided to uh, uh, stop turning the pile is very important. Uh, during this time, you're going to see a lot of the larger garden critters, uh, slug snails, beetles, and so forth. Uh, <coughs> competition, or, I'm sorry, decomposition is going to continue during the uh, curing process, but it's going to be uh, much slower. <clears throat> Earthworms, you'll see, uh, uh, they leave their castings. They help with aeration uh, and drainage by making tunnels uh, moving through the pile. <clears throat> Now we allow the pile to cure for several weeks, uh, anywhere from four weeks to six weeks, maybe eight weeks if we have the time. <clears throat> and decomposition <clears throat> helps us stabilize the final compost product. Um, it stabilizes it chemically by breaking down any uh, phytotoxic uh, chemicals such as ammonia. Uh, ammonia can actually kill uh, seedlings. Uh, it'll kill the roots. And uh, uh, it'll also kill beneficial organisms that are in the soil. 
So finished compost, once it's cured, is safe to use in potting mix or as a seed starting medium. Now, when things go wrong, uh, and sometimes they do, uh, extremes of sun and wind can affect your moisture balance. Um, again, if you, if you don't cover your pile, uh, you're subject to uh, some of those extremes. Uh, you may not have had enough materials to add uh, in correct proportion. Uh, so we're going to look at a list of uh, uh, problems and, and see what, uh, what their cause is. If your pile doesn't heat up, uh, it could be too small. Uh, again, uh, uh, we want to use something that, that's about at least a three by three by three uh, size. Uh, larger than that is, is uh, better, especially if you're trying to make enough compost to uh, uh, add to your garden soil. Uh, it may be too compacted or it may be too wet or too dry. Uh, and then insufficient nitrogen is another reason why uh, your pile may not heat up. If your pile only gets warm, uh, again, it could be insufficient air, water, or nitrogen, uh, and your particle size may be too large. If you uh, smell offensive odors, odors coming from the pile, um, well, if it's ammonia, uh, then you have too much nitrogen. So that ratio of uh, uh, carbon to nitrogen is, is uh, too low. Uh, if you smell rotten eggs or worse, uh, it's insufficient oxygen. Um, your aerobic bacteria have died and been replaced by anaerobic bacteria uh, because they thrive in a, in a um, low to no oxygen uh, environment. Uh, and you need to bury that last batch of uh, kitchen scraps in the, in the middle of the pile. That may also contribute to odors. If you see weird things growing on or around the pile or bin, uh, that's, that's fungi, uh, different moles and yeasts. I wish I had a picture of some of the things that I've seen growing around my compost pile uh, because they're, they're large, they're colorful, they appear just overnight. They look strange and alien, but it's, it's natural. It's just nature's way. Uh, your pile is going to shrink probably 30 to 40%. Uh, not not uh, necessarily half its original size. That's, that's a little extreme, but uh, uh, plan on at least 30 to 40 percent. Uh, you know, plants are mostly water when, when all those gases and that moisture have, have uh, uh, been released. Uh, there just isn't too much left. Okay, this is an interesting picture, and I want to uh, talk about <clears throat> odd things growing in and around your, your compost pile, uh, actually uh, unintended consequences. Um, at, the, at the very back of this picture, you can see uh, a bunch of uh, uh, palms and uh, that bucket on the uh, uh, pole that's right by my compost pile. Uh, we're looking down a, a, a bed of uh, unruly asparagus so uh, it's a little hard to see the actual compost pile, but it's at the very end of, of this bed of asparagus. Well, uh, I decided I wanted to plant some palm trees because uh, I have a neighbor who has uh, a bunch of lights. And uh, so I thought those palms would help uh, screen out uh, uh, the light from his uh, fixtures at night. And I had no uh, idea that I was planting those palms on the other side of the fence from my compost pile. Um, 
and you can see the result. Uh, in less than a year, those palms have gone crazy. Uh, they're uh, as high as the telephone wire, uh, much higher than the garage roof uh, that's to the right. And uh, they just keep proliferating. Um, so when you locate your compost pile, uh, think about what you might uh, want to plan in the future uh, around it because uh, those palms uh, are, are living at a HEB flagship and uh, uh, they're, they're, <laughs> they're getting out of hand. So uh, just be aware. Compost pile pH. Now pH is a scale that tells us how acid or alkaline something is. Uh, it's a scale of zero to 14, seven is neutral. And if, if you're below uh, seven, uh, you're on the acid side. If you're uh, above seven, uh, you're on the alkaline side. Compost created by thermophilic bacteria should be near a neutral pH of seven, anywhere from six, five to, to seven. Um, if temperatures get out of hand, though, and get too high during decomposition, um, it can um, cause the pile uh, to become acid. Um, if the pile becomes anaerobic uh, because of lack of oxygen, uh, it can also uh, make the pile acidic. Uh, if that happens, uh, or if you suspect that your compost pH is... Uh, uh, out of uh, neutral, uh, then flip the pile, uh, let it uh, uh, go through another process or two, and uh, your pH should neutralize. Tools and equipment. What do we need? Well, not a whole lot in the way of equipment. Uh, we, we absolutely need a water source. Uh, Again, urea is a good source for supplemental nitrogen. Uh, some sort of a hay fork is, is, uh, makes it easy to uh, uh, man, uh, manipulate the materials. Um, a compost thermometer is good. If you don't have a compost thermometer, uh, I've used a welding rod. And you can take that welding rod, stick it in the middle of the compost pile, uh, give it a minute so it heats up. Uh, pull it out, slap it against your arm, and yes, sir, that's hot. Okay, so you can you can judge temperature uh, by just using a metal rod if you uh, don't want to invest in a compost thermometer. A lawnmower is is helpful uh, to uh, shred your materials. And if you um, want, you can certainly get a chipper shredder. And uh, again, uh, just be very careful. And, and, uh, uh, but that's, that's a very handy thing for uh, shredding uh, all kinds of things that go in your compost pile. Uh, pair of leather gloves and safety glasses, uh, a wheelbarrow, uh, some kind of garden cart, uh, a leaf rake and a short rake. Uh, tarpaulin, if you want to, in fact, cover your pile. And when I'm standing knee deep in bacteria, uh, I'm definitely going to have a high top pair of rubber boots. So ways we can use it. Uh, <clears throat> we can use it as a soil amendment. Uh, we can use it as mulch, uh, potting mix additive, and a seed starting medium. Uh, and then we'll talk about compost tea. So if we're going to add compost to our soil, uh, it takes about 50 pounds of organic matter compost, uh, we're talking about, uh, per 100 square feet to raise your soil's organic content 1%. So 50 pounds will raise it 1%. 
uh, that's about four cubic feet of compost. Uh, or uh, it'll produce a layer that's about a half an inch deep if you spread it out over 100 square feet. We can add uh, up to 100 pounds, that's an inch uh, deep over your 100 square foot bed. Um, and that works out to about 8.3 cubic feet. Uh, and that will raise your organic content by 2%. So um, that's how much compost it takes to make a, a appreciable change in the organic matter content of your soil. If we add more organic matter, uh, it may cause plants to suffer a, a nitrogen deficiency. Uh, <clears throat> if, if we have too much uh, organic matter that is uh, of a high carbon um, content, uh, the, the microbes that are breaking down that uh, organic matter will compete with plants for soil nitrogen. And once the uh, microbes decide they want to compete with plants for soil nitrogen, they're going to they're going to beat the plants out every single time because the microbes are everywhere and plant roots are not. Um, so uh, until uh, those microorganisms uh, die and return their nitrogen to the soil, uh, you're going to have a deficiency of nitrogen if if you let that uh, uh, organic matter uh, get out of hand. Uh, microbes need nitrogen. If they can't get it in the compost, they will uh, compete with plants for it. Soil testing. Well, you can't manage what you cannot measure. Uh, soil tests to determine how much organic uh, matter percentage your soil has. Uh, uh, that's important to know. Strive to build organic matter content from four to six percent. This is going to be dependent on on what type of soil you have. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, if you get up to eight percent um, soil uh, organic matter percentage, uh, quit adding organic matter as an amendment um, and let that uh, uh, soil organic matter content gradually uh, go down from 8% because uh, from 4 to 6% is plenty. That's all we need. Uh, I would use organic matter as a mulch until that soil organic uh, uh, matter level drops. So uh, this is an old slide. Um, routine analysis has uh, gone up to $12. Um, I think the other uh, costs of, of uh, the different testing is still the same. Um, at uh, the uh, uh, extension office, they have uh, a soil sample information form, and it has the listing of all the different tests and how much they cost. Uh, let's go through these and see which ones are important uh, for you to have. Uh, and, and we're talking about your garden soil now. Uh, certainly a routine analysis because that gives you pH, it gives you the electrical conductivity and your macronutrients, your nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. For an additional $7, you can test for your micronutrients. Sodium, uh, which is something you don't want <laughs> a lot of, but uh, here we live on the Gulf Coast. Uh, I've been flooded uh, uh, by a hurricane uh, on occasion. So uh, you want to uh, know what that uh, sodium uh, level is in your soil. 
Uh, other important micronutrients are iron, zinc, manganese, and, and copper. Copper, again, is something we don't want uh, much of, but uh, we, can, we can at least see what our content is. Uh, and once we've tested for micronutrients, we probably don't need to test again for a while. And that would be maybe several years. Boron, if you suspect you have a boron deficiency, uh, this is a pretty inexpensive test uh, because that can uh, uh, cause some problems if, in fact, you're deficient in boron. Uh, Detail salinity. Uh, this is a, a test, again, to uh, uh, determine uh, uh, salinity and salts. Um, I would not worry about this test unless you've been flooded uh, with salt water. Uh, uh, during a hurricane. Um, the, the next one is organic matter percentage. And this is critical when it comes to uh, composting because uh, this tells you how much organic matter uh, you have in your soil. And uh, finally, your soil texture uh, determines what the percentage of sand, silt, and clay is and it will assign a, a textural class to uh, the percentages of, of uh, those materials. Uh, you probably only need a, a texture test once because you're not going to change your soil texture easily. Uh, it, it takes a wholesale replacement of or addition of uh, um, materials to uh, affect uh, what your uh, textural class will be. Uh, so uh, here's, here's an example of a, a, my soil test. My last one uh, gives me the textural class and organic matter percentage of my soil sample. So I had a textural analysis of 81% sand. Wow. Silt, 12%, and clay, 7%. I was hoping for uh, less sand and, and more silt and clay, but uh, as, as a result, I wound up with a loamy sand. But on the good side, uh, I had a 4.18% organic matter. So um, I, can, I can proudly say I practice what, what I preach, uh, having a 4.1 percentage of organic matter in a highly sandy soil is, is an accomplishment. Here's another graph that I got from uh, Rochester University in New York. Um, and it's, it's a good uh, graph to use uh, to make a determination about uh, how much organic matter uh, you, you have and how much uh, more you might need. So we have um, five levels from excellent, good, fair, poor, and bad uh, horizontally. Um, across those, we have uh, three lines. One is a, is a solid line, one is a uh, broken line, and the other is a dashed line. And the solid line, if you look over on the right-hand side, with a C stands for coarse. That means sand. So uh, my soil would be just to the right of that solid line because I have a very sandy soil. Um, and you can see uh, I had a 4.18 organic matter percentage. So if we look at the four on the bottom row, and follow that up to the top, you can see that's about as good as I can get with uh, that sandy soil. Now, if you have something that's uh, a high clay soil, then you're going to take this dash line to, on the right, and your soil will be somewhere to the left of that. Uh, so you can locate what kind of soil you have based on your soil texture test and how much organic matter you would need 
to uh, get into uh, a good uh, or excellent uh, profile. So, uh, as a mulch, well, if we had if we had uh, uh, commandments for the garden, uh, this would be one of the probably top uh, three or four commandments, and that would be leave no garden bed uncovered. Uh, when we use compost as a mulch, we're actually sheet composting. Uh, not only do we get all the benefits of using a mulch, but we also continue the composting and curing process on the surface of our garden beds. After harvest, uh, when hopefully the compost is finished, uh, we either till it in or not. Here's an example of one of my beds where I've planted um, uh, let's see, this would be cauliflower and uh, broccoli on 18 inch centers. <clears throat> and I put down compost as a mulch. And <clears throat> the compost isn't completely finished. As you can see, there's still some uh, pieces and uh, sticks and uh, whatnot. But uh, <clears throat> this is going to help uh, not only mulch my soil, but it's going to uh, add uh, fertility and organic matter to the soil uh, as those plants grow. <clears throat> if we use it as an additive, uh, we can put it in potting soil or seed starting mixes. Uh, we want to use the best compost that we, we have, so it should be very finished and finely screened. Uh, and the recommendation is that uh, we shouldn't exceed about a third of the total mixture. So if we're going to add it to potting soil, uh, we want to add uh, up to about a third. If we're going to use it as a seed starting mix, uh, then we're going to use um, compost, but only up to about a third. And everyone has one of these, right? Um, so uh, we want a much finer screen, though, uh, for finished compost than this. Uh, this is this is actually a screen for uh, uh, screening out rocks and uh, sticks and and other things uh, in in the. Uh, soil before we uh, put it back in the in the planting beds. Compost tea. Okay, let's talk about compost a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I have no idea what what's floating in that barrel, but um, if you look at at compost tea, um, it can be a combination of of uh, uh, just um, compost, it can be manure, it can be whatever, uh, throw it in the bucket and, and uh, add water and um, uh, let it steep for a while. And then you apply that to your uh, plants. Um, what is the benefit of compost tea? Well, um, what I'm looking at right here, uh, I, I just um, I go back to my ethics and I say, you know, what's, what's the scientific basis for uh, using something like this? Uh, because what I'm looking at is a bucket uh, that's got some kind of organic matter in it, but um, I'm looking at uh, what's, what's going to be in there is going to be a very dilute uh, leachate of whatever the um, manure or uh, organic matter was, and a whole bunch of anaerobic bacteria, because uh, that, that bucket is not uh, bubbly. Uh, there's no air in that bucket, so there's nothing but uh, anaerobic bacteria in there. And I'm not sure that that has much of a use 
uh, other than just uh, watering with some very dilute uh, nutrients. Um, there, there's some research that indicates that maybe uh, uh, compost tea, uh, especially anaerobic compost tea, uh, might have some pathogen uh, suppressing qualities. But uh, again, uh, there's, uh, the research on that is spotty. So I, I would certainly do your own. If you want to really make compost tea, you have to, you have to prepare it. And that means adding a bunch of stuff and bubbling it for um, a period of time to uh, build up the anaerobic uh, organisms that are going to be in there. So as far as I'm concerned, um, unless you're willing to really uh, prepare uh, uh, compost tea properly, um, this, this isn't going to be any more helpful than just uh, adding water and nutrients uh, to your plants. Okay, before we conclude, we haven't really talked about anything uh, uh, that we don't want to add to our pile. So let's, let's have a brief look at, at some of that. Um, I have a list here of several things, and with the exception of bones and ashes, uh, everything else on this list uh, would compost just fine. Meat, dairy products, fats, pet waste, weeds, disease plants, cardboard paper, and so forth. Um, so why would it be that we, we wouldn't want to add those? Well, meat and dairy products and certain fats and oils um, will attract uh, rodents. And uh, sometimes it's just not worth the hassle uh, trying to put up with that uh, uh, just to uh, compost a little bit of meat or, or dairy. Uh, pet wastes. Pet waste may, in fact, contain pathogens. So you want to be careful about adding that. Um, just like weeds and uh, uh, weed seeds, because unless you can kill all those weed seeds, all you're doing is spreading weeds. Same thing with disease plants and, and the pathogens that they carry. Uh, cardboard and paper, um, again, they compost just fine, but you got to balance them because they're high, high carbon. And uh, it takes a lot of nitrogen to uh, uh, balance the paper and, and cardboard. And ashes, um, first of all, I would never add um, uh, any charcoal ashes to my soil. Uh, I would add wood ashes and uh, wood ashes are very, very alkaline. They will kick up your pH uh, immediately and uh, could in fact uh, uh, get your pH out of whack. So uh, I would limit the amount of ash I, I put on my uh, garden soil to five or 10 pounds per year. And uh, I would keep up that routine um, uh, testing uh, just so I could monitor pH. And I guess that's, that's about it. Appreciate your attention and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.